March 1945. In a forgotten corner of Europe, a top secret mission is underway. A group of heavily armed men creep towards these two villas in northern Italy. Their target houses a key German headquarters just beyond the front line. Leading the attack are two men. Michael Lees is a spy sent by Winston Churchill's Special Operations Executive. Roy Farron is from the SAS. He's not even meant to be there. He had been confined to a desk, but hankered after the adrenaline of action. What's more, their mission was not even meant to be happening. It had been canceled by the Allied High Command. Both men were disobeying orders and risking a court-martial to carry out the attack. The only question was, could they pull it off? Or would they end up dead or in jail? The last year of World War II, Italy is a divided country. The dictator Mussolini had been overthrown 15 months earlier. The Italians had changed sides and now fought alongside the Allies in the south of the country. In the north, the Germans occupied the remainder of the country with the help of Italian fascists. The Allies' advance northwards had come to a halt over the winter just between the valley of the Po River and the Apennine Mountains. But now, with the advance stalled by the winter weather, the Allies wanted to maintain their momentum. They needed someone to raise hell before the major offensive everyone knew would follow in the spring. That man was SOE agent Michael Lees. Michael Lees had always enjoyed adventure. As a boy, he loved the outdoors and joined up at the outbreak of war. He found himself first in India and then in the desert, in a parachute battalion. But for the thrill seeker Lees, it wasn't enough. He yearned for real action. So he decided to join SOE, the Special Operations Executive. The initial task given to SOE was to subvert enemy occupation of Western Europe. Lees decided to bluff his way in. He told me the story of how he talked himself into SOE. He simply turned up and said, here am I, I'm a trained parachutist. I would like to work with you. He then cut his teeth fighting with the partisans in Yugoslavia. Soon, he became a seasoned operator who loved the life of danger. Now he was taking this valuable experience with him on his new mission, codename Envelope. It was his third SOE operation. This time, he was to work with Italian partisan groups. Michael Lees's Dakota was heading for the Northern Apennines in German-occupied Italy. In plain daylight, the Dakota lined up on the drop zone. Lees jumped from the aircraft and parachuted in on the 3rd of January, 1945. He landed here, near the village of Febbio, 
in the foothills of the Apennines. Lees immediately set about finding the local partisans. They were hiding deep in the mountains that surrounded the landing zone. The name of this group was the Reggiani Division. It was a disparate band of fighting men with different political allegiances. The majority were communists. Their numbers were also boosted by a strange collection of deserters from the German army. Many of these deserters were Russian prisoners of war who had been conscripted into German units and then had fled. So you'd get this odd combination of perhaps a German weapon, big red neckerchief, particularly if, say, if you were communist. There was, of course, the great one of, of festooning yourself with belted ammunition uh, and looking tremendously martial and fierce. But appearances could be deceptive. While the guerrillas appeared fearsome, they were not always an effective fighting unit. Lise's task was to change all that. The partisans did, however, have one advantage, the terrain in which they operated. The valleys were steep and well protected. Access by road was difficult. And the guerrillas held all the key mountain passes. The Germans in the valley below only very occasionally attempted to penetrate this mountain refuge. And the partisans could simply withdraw and hide in the woods. This gave the SOE agent, Michael Lees, a degree of security. First, Lees quickly settled on the remote hillside village of Secchio as his base. It became known as the British Mission. But Lees only had a smattering of Italian, so he immediately began to recruit anyone from the local area who might help him, especially English speakers. This included 17-year-old Bruno Gimple, who had been born in England, but who'd lived in Italy since the outbreak of war. I was in this little village on the northern side, and I was asked to carry a message for the British mission to a higher place, higher up in the mountains. So I went up and I walked into this mission, and I was, and, um, I was met by Captain Lees. And I said, I have a message for you. You have a message for you, speak English. Yes, I was born in England. Well, then you must stay here with us. Bruno Gimple quickly began to realize what kind of man Lees was. He lived with him at this house in Secchio. My first memory of Michael Lees was a man with a mission, put it that way. A fixed idea, looking for action. The war was almost ending, and he wanted to have a scrap. I think, in a way, he was looking for glory. I don't want to be nasty, but it was very egocentric. Didn't have much space for anybody else but himself, put it that way. Then, having made contact with the partisans and created a base for operations, Lees began to organize his men but he needed more firepower. A special drop zone was selected here at Casse Balocchi. Dakotas flew in more and more supplies. Rifles, anti-tank weapons, and old SOE favorites followed in ever-increasing numbers, including Sten guns. 
It's an iconic SOE resistance weapon. It's crude, it's welded, it's spot welded. Nine mil caliber, all German pistol and submachine gun ammunition was nine mil. So you can get your ammo off, off the bad guys. With their new guns, the men were now on a war footing. Lees instructed the partisans to increase their attacks on the Germans. And they upped the tempo, hitting more columns and increasing their ambushes on highways and patrols. It kept them busy. Every now and then they cut some telephone lines, blew up a train, blew up some tracks and uh, attacked a convoy. It was always touch and run. That's, that's what partisanship is, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Lees was often on the move, trying to spur on different attacks. Life was hectic. Dangerous, dirty. Sometimes we were running with the crowds on our tail. Uh, sometimes we were visiting, visiting uh, partisan units. Sometimes we were planning something, uh, so moving around, visiting another mission. Remember, every province, province next door, there was another mission. Then in February 1945, an intriguing piece of intelligence came to Michael Lees' attention. It came from an unusual source an Austrian deserter called Hans. He had been serving in a German parachute unit and had run away to the partisans. He had even taken his German truck with him. Yeah, Hans Amors, I remember him very clearly. Tall, blonde. <laughs> I didn't like him. Nevertheless, Hans seemed desperate to fight back at the Germans. He told Lees that there was an important German headquarters at the hamlet of Bottegi, 30 miles away on the valley floor. But could Hans be trusted? Was it a trap? Lees had to find out more. He needed to establish whether there was a unit based there if so, which one? And how might it be involved when the Allies finally launched their spring offensive? He immediately called into play the partisan's secret weapon, the Stafetas. The Stafetas is, is the function. Kura, Kura. That's how they originally started carrying messages, and then they became something much more vital. They were young Italian girls, recruited by the partisans to gather intelligence on the Germans. The espionage was very, very important. In partisan warfare, you have to know everything about the, the enemy. Jerry will never catch you if you know everything about him. They spied by using their charm and befriending the Germans. One of the girls went down to Bottegi to find out more. After chatting up the German sentries, she confirmed the presence of the headquarters and gave detailed information on the target. Two villas straddled the road that led to Bottegi. Villa Rossi and Villa Calvi were 150 meters apart. They housed the forward headquarters of the German 51st Corps and the 14th Army Group and oversaw a large part of the front line. Villa Calvi housed the actual headquarters and communications centre. Villa Rossi, the staff and other quarters. What's more, the general responsible for this large section of the front often stayed there. It was a perfect target. 
If Lees could destroy the buildings and capture or kill an important general, it would decapitate the Germans' command structure along a vast portion of the front. It was a tremendous opportunity. Lees's chance personally to play a key role in the push to end the war. Of course, uh, Lees was all for it because this is what he was looking for. And the timing could not have been better. The Allies were now getting ready to launch the long-awaited spring offensive. The date was set for the 6th of April 1945. It gave Lees two months to prepare his attack. One of the things the Allied commanders wanted to do was to ensure that uh, when the offensive broke over the German lines, there was maximum disruption. Knowing this, Lees instructed his radio operator to call for clearance to strike. The reply came back from headquarters to proceed. The assault was christened Operation Tombola. But Lees had a problem. The partisans were satisfactory fighters for sabotage and skirmishes, but what he needed for this daring attack was a more skilled military team. Hardened fighting men who could stiffen up the ragtag partisans and press home the attack. So he requested a particular kind of reinforcement, the Special Air Service, or SAS. The SAS were elite fighters. They were formed in 1941 by Colonel David Sterling. The unit made its name as desert raiders who attacked enemy supply dumps and targets way behind the lines. Their favorite ride was the Jeep. The SAS took this all-terrain vehicle and made it their own. They stripped them down and festooned them with weapons and supplies. The Jeep allowed the SAS to cover vast distances. These fighters had built up an awesome reputation. The radio operator told me, yes, yes, those are the fellows who jumped from, jumped from the aeroplane with parachutes with a dagger in their teeth. They had accompanied the Allies into France in June 1944 and continued their marauding operations there. They took with them their jeeps. They seemed perfect for the raid. At SAS headquarters in Italy, news of Operation Tombola came across the desk of this man, Roy Farron. He was one of the most decorated men ever to join the Special Air Service. Roy Farron was a soldier through and through, a hard-as-nails veteran. He had fought in the Western Desert and in Crete. But outwardly, Farron did not seem to fit the stereotype of a ruthless war hero. A very nice person, smooth, was always very genteel. If I had met him in the street, I wouldn't have thought that he was a highly respected warrior. He was, mind you. Highly respected warrior. In 1942, he narrowly escaped death. But his reaction was not as one might expect. Farron felt he'd been given back his life. So might throw it away again as often as he chose. From that moment, he had set his sights on a life of unadulterated action. Farron quite liked to be where excitement was going on. He simply enjoyed being where he was in danger of being killed. 
He was exactly the kind of charismatic adventurer and marauder that typified the SAS. But by this stage of the war, his fighting days seemed to be over. There wasn't enough action to go around. So he'd been given an uninspiring staff job at SAS headquarters. For Farron, the sound of Operation Tom Bowler's attack on an enemy headquarters was just too irresistible. So he hatched a plan. On the 6th of March, 1945, the advance party of SAS parachutists prepared to board a flight of Dakotas at an airfield near Florence. Farron told his superiors he would like to accompany the SAS party on their flight and wave them off. The men were to be dropped in to meet with Lees. On this occasion, they had to leave their beloved Jeeps at home. For the time being, at least. As the airborne party cruised over Lise's landing zone, the men began to jump. Then, Farron grabbed a parachute and leapt out of the transport. It was a cavalier act of disobedience that risked ruining his military career. On landing, he claimed he had accidentally fallen out of the aircraft and radioed back to base to say, as he was there, he may as well carry on and take command of his men. So do you believe that he, he actually took it upon himself to jump out? Oh, of course. Of course, he did. We wanted to be in the action. It's not the type of man that's sitting behind a desk. Far from it. Lees and Farron wasted no time in preparing for the attack. In the intervening days, Farron sent for more men and heavy weapons. The SAS started to tool up. Seemingly, Farron could have delivered whatever he wanted. They got their hands on the sort of kit they loved. Heavy machine guns, three-inch mortars, and even a lightweight portable artillery piece, the 75 mm pack howitzer. All dropped by parachute. Soon, there were 40 SAS men in all. And the new arrivals lived up to their reputation. Excellent. Very professional. Diehards. <laughs> Diehards. Then, Farron called for one last unusual bit of kit. Once again, he proved he could rustle up anything he wanted. It was a piper, complete with his bagpipes, dropped by parachute to the Operation Tombola team. So a piper arrives with kilt and pipes and all the right kit, parachutes in, the Italians are oh, gobsmacked. They're amazed by it. Farron believed a piper would serve two purposes. First, it would hearten the men's morale. And second, it would show the Germans this was a British operation, a way to avoid reprisals amongst the local civilians. The plan for Operation Tombola was relatively straightforward. It 
consisted of an attack force of 100 men. There was Lee's, his personal bodyguard called the Black Bats, and 40 partisans. 40 Russian deserters also joined the force, accompanied by Hans the Austrian. Finally, there were 20 SAS men under Farron's command. The remaining SAS stayed behind with other partisans to defend the camp. The battle plan called for separate raiding parties to target each villa. Villa Calvi, the communications center, and Villa Rossi, the staff headquarters and accommodation. But there was a complication. Guarding the villas was a garrison of 60 Germans and a quick reaction force based three kilometers down the road, totaling 300 men. Anti-aircraft positions nearby took the total number of Germans to 500. Farron instructed the deserters to form a defensive perimeter, preventing reinforcements reaching the villas. Despite the odds, the one advantage was surprise. On the 21st of March, 1945, the mission was greenlit. Everything was good to go. The party began to move down into the valley and started the 30-mile trek to the villas. But then as they did so, a hitch. Allied headquarters suddenly got cold feet. They sent a message cancelling Tombola. For Farron and Lees, it was a bitter disappointment. What's more, it risked angering the partisans who had been whipped up into an enthusiastic mood and might consider it a breach of trust. Everything had been organized. The three or four groups that formed an attack group had all been chosen. And they were all billeted in different places and they all convened on the same day with the same... It was all organised. So Lees and Farron now made a momentous decision. They would disobey orders. They risked a court-martial, expulsion from the armed forces and possibly jail. They headed down into the valley below. The attack force that moved out was powerfully armed with Bren machine guns, Stens and Tommy guns, and a bazooka. They made the treacherous journey down to the valley floor. It took just over 24 hours. The men made it to a nearby farmhouse and waited for nightfall. As darkness came, they took up their positions. Remember, the German HQ was in the plains, occupied by the fascists and by the German army, not partisan area. You, you couldn't possibly get there in daytime. They would, be, they would have been stopped far earlier. So you have to sneak in. And in night time. At Villa Calvi, housing the communications equipment, the first team of SAS men and partisans crept right up to the objective. They 
attacked. The air echoed with gunfire and the rousing sounds of Highland Laddie played on the bagpipes. The team charged the rear of the villa. The men brought out the bazooka to break into the villa, but it missed fire. Despite this, some SAS men managed to fight their way inside and capture the ground floor. But the resistance intensified. The Germans held the upper floors and fought back. Unable to capture the top stories, the men had to devise another plan. So they set fire to the building, hoping to trap and burn the Germans alive. At the other building, Villa Rossi, the German guards were now alerted. The element of surprise had been lost. The SAS men and Michael Lees charged the building and battled their way in under intense fire. Their aim was to find the general and kill him. But here too, the Germans on the upper floors clung on. Meanwhile, beyond the villas, a massive firefight had broken out. The German garrison raced to the villas, but the deserters' blocking force was waiting. The Germans hit them head on. Fernand had put all the Russians and the Italians on the outskirts, round the villa in a semicircle, and had them firing constantly in the opposite direction. And the Germans we were billeted all over the place when the first, uh, the first, first firing arrived running down the stro roads and so on. And there was a massacre. Nobody knows exactly how many Germans were killed, but a lot. After 20 minutes of vicious fighting, Farron finally gave the signal to retreat. Many Germans lay dead including a senior commander, and the attackers had only narrowly missed the general for the whole section of the front. The two villas were in flames, the communications equipment and offices ablaze. The attack had been a huge success. The remaining raiders now melted away into the night and fled to the hills above. The attackers, exhausted, regrouped in their mountain hideout to assess the damage. Three SAS troopers lay dead, and the attackers had a handful of wounded. Michael Lees, the SOE agent, had been wounded by shrapnel and bullets in the battle for the staircase at Villa Rossi. He was now missing in action. Six attackers captured by the Germans had been executed on the spot. A similar fate seemed likely for Lees. Farron desperately awaited news of his fighting comrade. Finally, he had it. 
Though seriously injured, Lise was alive and hiding in the valley. But he was in real danger. He had been shot three times and had severe nerve damage in his leg. He needed urgent hospital treatment or else he would die. So Farron did what he knew best. He hatched a plan and rustled up the means to execute it. Farron called his base and organized a medical evacuation. The plan was to use a captured German Fiesler Stork liaison aircraft to extract Lees. It was to land here, on a tiny patch of ground on a remote hillside. It seemed an impossible feat of airmanship. Lees made it to the landing site. And sure enough, the stork appeared on the horizon and began its dangerous approach. It took five attempts. But finally, the Italian pilot performed a miracle landing. Michael Lees was sent first to Florence, then home to Britain for treatment. His life was saved, thanks to Farron and the bravery of the pilot. But now Farron faced an even bigger problem. The Germans were coming. They had launched a full counter-attack. Hundreds of well-equipped troops were sent into the hills. But Farron was ready to meet them and planned an ambush. He summoned his heavy weapons. He knew exactly how to exploit the high ground and place them effectively. He used his Vickers heavy machine guns to fire on the Germans sent to attack the partisans. Importantly, he used the weapon's capacity for indirect fire. In other words, firing out of sight of the enemy. Using an arcing trajectory, the gun could fire over hills or ridges. Similarly, his men used the three-inch mortars they had received to devastating effect. They could hit the Germans without being seen. The German attacks on their camp were beaten back. They retreated, leaving many dead. Then came a new mission a few days later, radioed from base. The long-anticipated spring offensive had begun. 900,000 Allied troops were on the march. Farron was ordered to support them by mounting offensive operations, attacking German units behind enemy lines. His main task was to harass German columns and German-held towns along Highway 12, which linked the front line with the city of Modena. But this meant moving out of the mountain stronghold and down into the valley below. This terrain required a new type of mobile warfare.
Farron knew exactly what to do. He put in a call for some familiar friends. A handful of Willis Jeeps were dropped to him by Halifax bomber. The drop it with four parachutes, one for each corner. And then they'd come down, landed on the field. Four Jeeps, heavily armed Jeeps, with a double Vickers K in front and an American 12 and a half millimeter machine gun, heavy machine gun in the back on a Jeep. <laughs> The men were now mobile, back once again in their well-armed jeeps. They tore around the countryside, attacking numerous columns and garrisons. As the Allied advance neared, Farron and the jeeps led lightning raids all along Highway 12. It's caused extraordinary amount of damage to the Germans. And it's the unexpected nature of these attacks. It's not where you can hear aircraft approaching and think, right, you know, we can take cover. No, suddenly around the corner comes a bunch of jeeps and you're under attack. And that was the nature of some of his operations. Then as quickly as he arrived, he was gone. Next, he called for the heaviest weapon in his arsenal the 75mm pack howitzer. With the jeeps, he was able to tow the compact weapon and ammunition wherever he chose. And Farron pulled off one of his most audacious moves. He drove the jeeps and their howitzer to this spot overlooking the town of Sassuolo. From here, he fired over 70 shells at German vehicles, buildings and bridges. It's like the dream of every gunnery officer at Royal Artillery School, but there's his target. And in effect, from the point of view of all Germans trying to withdraw, shells are coming out of nowhere on the bridge causing traffic jams, and of course, the traffic jams in turn attract Allied fighters. The small force was fulfilling its mission of harassment behind enemy lines to perfection. Farron explained that a few shells from the pack howitzer landing in a small garrison town behind the lines caused much more panic than attacking it directly from close quarters. The German garrison would either suffer casualties, would perhaps sometimes even evacuate the area because there was this unexpected attack out of the middle of nowhere. It was a tactic that worked brilliantly. And he repeated the trick 19 times. Meanwhile, the main Allied offensive was crushing the German forces at the front line. The spring offensive went according to plan. After 23 days of fighting in late April 1945, the advancing armies caught up with Farron. The war was over for him and the partisans. They came down from the mountains to greet the Allies and to savor the victory. The efforts of Farron and Lees had played a small but valuable part in the wider triumph. But both men expected to be in deep trouble. Farron shouldn't even have been there, and both men had disobeyed orders. At worst, such a crime meant jail. At best, dishonorable discharge. 
Farron now had to answer for his disobedience. But he was in for a surprise. He had been so effective attacking the Germans ahead of the American forces that the Americans decorated him. Farron was awarded the Legion of Merit. In his case, he proved the SAS motto, who dares, wins. It was a personal triumph. His medal tally at war's end also included a DSO, MC, and two bars. But Lee's was not so lucky. Despite still recovering from his three bullet wounds, his SOE personnel file showed the gravity of the situation. This officer gave considerable trouble from the moment he was first infiltrated. Lee's was troublesome, insubordinate, unreasonable, tactless, irresponsible, and high-handed. In the end, it was Farron who came to his rescue. He wrote a detailed report praising the heroism of his SOE comrade. It saved Lees from a court-martial, but his card was forever marked. After the war, he tried to join MI6, but was rejected and returned to civilian life. But there was at least one group of people who recognized Lise's achievement. In gratitude for Tombola, he was made a freeman of the nearby city of Reggio Emilia. He unveiled a plaque to the fallen at Villa Rossi in 1949 and was made an honorary member of the SAS Regimental Association in 1985. For the adventurer Farron, however, life without war was harder to contemplate. He never has the same buzz, the same rewards, the same excitement as he had as a Special Forces soldier in the Second World War. So he stayed in the army and found himself in Palestine in 1946, a new war zone. Zionist paramilitaries were fighting for a Jewish state and the removal of the British administration of Palestine. The British were enduring an increasingly violent campaign of bombings and guerrilla action. In May 1947, Farron was accused of murdering a 16-year-old boy, Alexander Rubovitz. The teenager was caught by a British patrol putting up a resistance poster. He was beaten to death with a rock. A hat, left at the scene, pointed to Farron. A long legal battle ensued, and Farron eventually returned to face a military trial in Jerusalem. In the end, the former SAS man was acquitted. Despite this episode, Roy Farron managed to pick himself up. He traveled to Canada, where he started a new life. He and Michael Lees both captured the excitement of their days as clandestine warriors in writing. No one denies that Farron and Lees broke all the rules of military discipline in their pursuit of action. But it paid off. 
the raid was a huge success. It became the stuff of SAS legend. And both men got away with it. <laughs> 